Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Astrid, and I am definitely an alcoholic. I have lots and lots of paper and stuff. I know. First of all, I am definitely not an authority on this step. I've had an experience, and I am not one of those, um, let me teach a four-step workshop. I know exactly how you should do it. Where's your homework assignment? You didn't write it right. So I've had lots of experience with writing it, and I think that that's really, I feel that that's what this whole step is really all about. And um, there's a couple of things that Bill Wilson really wants to hit home. Every time a person imposes his instincts unreasonably upon others, unhappiness follows. If the pursuit of wealth tramples upon people who happen to be in the way, then anger, jealousy, and revenge are likely to be aroused. That's for sure me. I don't push my emotions in. I I come out. Like, I'm going to get at you. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to burn your house down. I'm a hater. I'm frustrated. I lead with my wound. I'm toxic for people. I overthink it. I overtalk about it. I'm mad at you, but I won't talk to you about it. I'll tell everybody else. And I just generate more and more anger. And I don't need liquor to do this. Like, it really, really poisons my soul. Uh, let's see. If sex runs riot, there's a similar uproar. Demands made upon other people for too much attention, protection, and love can only invite domination or revulsion in the protectors themselves. So I'm either trying to dominate and freaking control you, you know, or I'm, I'm, push, I'm pushing you away or you're pushing me away. I have no idea how to be in brotherly and harmonious action with my family, with my fellows, with coworkers, with people on the freeway, with people at Starbucks, with people in the Trader Joe lines. I can't do it. I can't live in this world. I really can't. And liquor is but a symptom. So let's see what Bill says. When individuals' desire for prestige becomes so uncontrollable, whether in the sewing circle, I haven't seen a sewing circle lately, but whatever, or at the international conference table, you know, other people suffer and revolt. This collision of instincts can produce anything from a cold snub to a blazing revolution. In these ways, we are set in conflict, not only with ourselves, but with people around us. So these instincts, also in the 12 and 12 bill, will say they balk at investigation. They balk at investigation because self doesn't want to reveal self to self. And don't you show me and don't you tell me what's wrong with me. And when you say things like, Slow down, Turbo. You know, I just think, slow down, Turbo. Or when somebody comes up to me and says, you know, could we talk for a few minutes? I just think, can we talk for a few minutes? And I just, I can't, when you ask me to slow down, I don't see that, that, that you're asking me to, 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 maybe you're trying to even help me. Maybe you're trying to help me breathe. Or when you want to talk to me about something, maybe I could see that we could go further in our relationship. So, with that being said, I look in step four, and I love when Bill says that um, we're in how it works, and it says resentments are the number one offender, destroys more alcoholics than anyone, from it stems all forms of spiritual disease. I have not only been mentally and physically ill, but I've been spiritually sick. You know, and for me, I I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. I don't think that alcohol came and then I got spiritually sick. I feel, for me, in my experience, I was spiritually sick for a long time and emotionally sick, and then I poured alcohol on top of it because I couldn't function in this world anymore. And then I really blew my life up. And I love this one part at the top of 65 where... At the bottom of 64, he says, we asked ourselves, why were we angry? In most cases, we found that it was our self-esteem, our pocketbook, our ambition, our personal relations, including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore. And here's this line. So we were burned up. So my last sponsor, Shelby, said, 
I don't want you to write anything that you weren't burned up about. Don't tell me some story about something you're thinking about. I want burned up. He says, I want untreated alcoholism. This is when you get to go into your past and pull up all the rage and the hostility and the frustration and the anger. And I want you to write your inventory from angry, untreated ego, injustification, people who've treated me wrong, done me poorly, because I've built this relationship with God, and I've made a decision in step three to turn my will and my life over. So I've had an experience with a power. So when I make a fearless moral inventory, I have enough power to go in here and not be so full of self that I'm ashamed and I'm embarrassed and I'm afraid anymore. There's a willingness that comes from tapping into an infinite power. So it becomes easier to write. And I can tell you the process that I had was... I would go into these stories and, you know, I'd, I'd break down my grudge list and, and then I'd put the cause on the paper and I'd really generate it and try to bring it up so that I could see what my ego and what my instincts were doing and, and, and how I was motivated by trying to control the people around me and dominate situations. And then just one or two resentments at a time and I'd be exhausted for the whole day. There's no way I could ever personally sit and write like 10 of them in a row. It didn't work for me that way. And it wasn't a race. It probably took me about four months to do my last, uh, fourth step. And I think I had 18 resentments on there. And so what I did was I did it exactly as outlined in the big book. My sponsor, my last sponsor said, no, Ditto. She said, please, I'm not an authority. You can use Xerox, anything, do the hokey pokey, do your extended columns. I'll do whatever. You know, but I had three three columns on the front page, and then the back side was my part in it. So I put the person's name, I put the cause, and then I put how it affects my self-esteem, my security, my ambition, my sex relation, and my pocketbook. And I write that from untreated alcoholism. I write this with my ego. I write this with my old character. And the back side, I write with my God consciousness and my new character. And I'll see so many patterns. I think I'm so clever and so smart, but when I start looking at my resentments, oh my God, it's the same, you know, self-imposed crisis, self-manufacturing of my own misery, you know, trying to meet some kind of calamity with serenity and doing it very, very poorly over and over and over, you know, getting in my own way. And for me, there was a lot of self-righteousness. Um, I'm looking at my old boyfriend, you know, it's really interesting to look at this because I did this inventory about four and a half years ago, and most of these are gone. Thank you, God, to go back in this. It's unbelievable. It really did work. But So one, an old boyfriend a long time ago, he didn't even drink, and he had the nicest mom, and I was a raging lunatic, and my resentment at this time, just four and a half years ago, was that boyfriend never stood up to me, for, for me to his mom, and his mom would just be like, get her out of here, God, she's so beneath you, why are you dating someone like this, she's disgusting, she's drunk, she gets pee why she breaks out in the handcuffs, she's vile, she smokes, cusses. And, and, yeah, and this is the kind of, how did it affect my self-esteem? Don't they know that I'm a direct descendant of John Quincy Adams? I'm a how, and they're dumb Italians. She should know the worth in me. I really wrote that, and I meant it. Don't they know? Yeah, I'm a blo- I have a bloodline, a blo- Bostonian blue bloodline. Security. My boyfriend needs to be more of a man and stand up to his mother for me. Ambition. How, how, how does, how, so, so my ambition is how does it stop me? I want him to protect me, be the man that he's supposed to be, show him I'm the woman, I'm the girl, you know, I'm some kind of a trophy. I mean, this stuff never works. You don't, you don't get love and respect from that door. The ego is bombarding a situation and demanding it, and I'm just going to get what I always get, sex relations. How does it affect my sex relation? Men don't ever work out for me. Relationships always fail. I mean, come on, you know. And then I get to turn it on the back side. And I get to do the prayer in the fourth step. God, this is a sick man like myself. How can I be helpful? Save me from being angry. Not my will, but thine be done. Where had I been selfish? 
I really wanted to keep him away from his mother, and I felt in very, very big competition with him because he had such a good, nurturing, loving relationship with her, and I didn't. I wanted him to adore me. I wanted him. I wanted him to be with me like he was with her, but I had no capacity to pull this off. Where was I dishonest? I had an expectation that he should act like a husband, and yet I acted like a drunk lunatic. You know, I couldn't even meet him in that place where I expected you to be something for me. I was an untreato bandito. Self-seeking. What were my self-seeking thoughts? He should honor and cherish me more than his mother, and yet I did nothing to earn this respect. Absolutely nothing. If anything, I tore his family apart, and I triangulated, and I wedged. Oh, you're going to go with your mom because it's her birthday? It's Friday night. I asked you three weeks ago we're supposed to go to the movie, and it's your mom's birthday, and I asked you three weeks ago. Oh, okay, now you're going to flip the script on me? I mean, I was so unreasonable. I was to the point of being cruel and guilt-tripping and just not being nice. Where was I afraid? I was afraid that I would lose the battle and be second best. You see, the ego always thinks it needs to win. It's forging ahead, trying to get something. And then when it gets there, like, let's just say I won. And he decided, all right, I'm not going to talk to my mom for six months and I'll nurture the relationship, which is the most ridiculous thing. <laughs> That's what I would like to come up with. But you can see that that would, ne- that would never satisfy me. Then the queen would want something else. You see, the only way to meet into these relationships is through true humility, where, you know, in the ideal, in the end, where we write down the ideal sex relation, it's not my ideal that I'm looking for in someone else. It's who could I be for you? Could I be a listener? Could I be forgiving? Could I be understanding? And, um, you know, the conclusion that I come to all the time in the end is that there's only one reason why I should be in a relationship with anyone, including blood, including family. There's only one reason left, and that is because we enjoy each other's company. You can't complete me, and I can't complete you. I'm never going to be your queen, and you're never going to be my king. You're not going to support me. You're not going to take care of me. It doesn't go that way. These are unreasonable demands, unreasonable expectations. And when I meet a situation with an expectation like that, I'm going to get hurt every single time because subconsciously my mind is setting me up for unbelievable failure. And so often the subconscious mind does this without my permission. It does it in my sleep. It does it way back here I'm not even aware of it because like Tony or somebody Ron Good said last night the conscious mind is this tiny little point and the subconscious mind is this vast vast um, uh, iceberg that I can't even tap into and unfortunately for us the iceberg is tapped into all of my instincts which are warped on top of my very very warped childhood where nurturing was you get love for doing this and you get hate for doing that. You better behave this way and not that way. You know, I remember just being like creative and I'd come home from school in first or second grade and I'd say, you know, the clouds had giraffes in them. And my mom would say, where's your homework? Where's your math? And I realized the clouds don't have giraffes anymore. I brought, I brought my homework, my homework, good child, good. And I could see all my creativity being squashed and I just begin to get molded into this thing and molded and molded and molded until the resemblance of what God wanted me in the beginning has almost, there's no, there's almost no resemblance to the character I am today. So then we go into You know, and I wanted to touch on the instincts for sex security and my desire to be somebody in society. I feel that it's so valuable to pick those apart and to continue to self-reflect. And even when a a alcoholic thought floats my mind, a thought floats the the surf, the waves of my brain, I look at it and sometimes I do analyze it a little more like, what instinct was that? Was that my instinct for security or sex or my desire for some kind of approval? Because approval's not going to do it. And security, you don't get security. The world is crazy. There are car accidents and there's cancer and people lose jobs. There's only one full reliance and one ultimate authority. And it is a loving God. And it's in continuous action that I have to be. I don't just do this 
homework thing with a sponsor and we sit somewhere in the desert in this glorious, you know, environment and I read and regurgitate all this stuff and then Glenda, like the fairy princess in a big bubble and a wand comes in and poof, I'm a new character and I don't fucking cuss anymore or hate everybody. It doesn't go like that for me. I mean, there's a lot of self-searching and a lot of work to be done for me. And then I go into my uh, sex relationships in the fourth step and the sex relationships aren't about penis and vagina although they can be but some, some people like don't let anybody see your sex relationship it's not like you know did you take it in the ass bestiality how much more <laughs> it's not that it's like how do I treat the opposite sex how do I how do I condemn you how do I have expectations of you how do I manipulate you how do my here's a good one my picker's broken well what kind of picking have I been picking with my broken pick and where are the patterns over and over and my unreasonable demands of these people that could never, I mean, they are, most of the men that I've picked are, are so mentally ill. I have the completely unreasonable expectation that they're going to like get a job and rise above and stop stealing my jewelry and stop lying. I don't need to get, I'm crazy. I'm absolute, and maybe he's good looking or he has muscles or he has a cute smile or a big dick or something. And then I think, this is it. And I tie it in some weird package and I'm like, you're going to wake up and be the thing, right? And then 30, 60 days into it, I hate you. And I just told everybody how in love I was like three weeks ago. I'm so in love. I've never been so in love in my whole life. It's amazing. Oh my God, this is the fun. He's so awesome. And I make out with him in front of everybody. And then I can't stand him. And the next time you guys see me, I'm like, dude, don't touch me for my friends. I'm a freak. I'm a lunatic. So in the book, it says, the sex relations there's nine things how did it uh, wh where was I selfish dishonest and considerate where was uh, who did I hurt did I arouse jealousy did I arouse suspicion did I arouse bitterness where was I at fault and then what should I have done differently? That's an interesting column because the what should I have done differently, if I use the old character ego mind, I couldn't have done anything differently because I was a sheeple. I was completely asleep. I wasn't even awake yet. So there's not a choice of point of A or B. What should I have done differently? I should have called AA and gotten the hell out of Dodge and gotten a sponsor instead of continuing my patterns throughout my life. But when I look at these patterns, I can see and over and over where, you know, where was I selfish? I wanted a partner. I wanted a husband. I wanted someone to take care of me. You know, where was I inconsiderate? I would argue all the time. I would go through their things. I would violate their space. Um, who did I hurt? You hurt me. I'm going to hurt you twice as badly. I felt an eye for an eye. You know what? You, I even think that you did something wrong to me, and now it's on and cracking. You're going to get it. And I need to see these patterns because they discolor my entire, my, my whole, I mean, it's the same thing over and over. I'm just a walking ball of ego structure, defiance, grandiosity, impatience. You want a piece of me? Let's go. And it's awful. It's so sad. Where was I at fault? You know, where was I at fault? I was hurt so much that all I wanted to do is hurt other people. And so I see these patterns, and then I go into a fear inventory, and what am I afraid of, you know? And there was these three columns where I, first I write down the fear, and then I say, I ask myself, did self-reliance fail me? Which is always, of course it did. And then there's a prayer that goes along with it. And, you know, it's interesting even looking at this. So I'm afraid I'm going to die of hepatitis C. I've had it for 36 years. You know, I, I, I look at it, and, and I, I still have that fear today. That one's not gone. But um, what can I do? I, you know, I turn my will and my life and my blood work and my liver over to the care of God. And I try to the best of my ability to take supplements and vitamins and I drink Kangen water, and I try to keep my body really clear. And interestingly enough, I would never want to make Sheldon wrong. He was a great sponsor for this. But he said, when I read him that, he said, uh-uh. That's still self-reliance. You just believe that God's healing you. Don't go into the vitamin thing. I don't want to hear about the water. That's one more self thing. Uh-uh. Maybe you can eat chocolate cake. Maybe you can have Coca-Cola. How do you know? 
See, if you're putting your self-reliance, or if you're putting reliance on your vitamins, you're telling yourself one more story. And I was like, damn, dude, I don't like that. I still don't like that. But it was an interesting moment. And I can beg to differ with my sponsor. We don't have to, uh, we don't have to agree, you know. Eva, my landlord, I was afraid she was going to raise the rent. You know what? Eva's in the hospital with stage 5 cancer. She probably has six weeks left to live, and she never raised the rent. Her stepson is a pervert. I was always afraid he was going to, like, hit on me. He's never even said another word to me. This was five years ago. I'm afraid I'm going to get cancer. I still don't have cancer. I'm afraid I'm going to be taken. I'm afraid I'm going to remain out of my mom's will. I'm in my mom's will now. I'm afraid of rejection. Well, God, I got more friends than I know what to do with. I'm afraid of being broke. I've never made so much money in my whole life. I take home over six figures, and that's not to brag. I'm just telling you, when I wrote this, there was no six figures. I was squeezing pennies. I'm afraid of getting really fat. I am the exact same weight as I was when I wrote this. <laughs> I'm afraid of getting intimate. You know, man, that's a tough one. I don't know. Don't get too close. <laughs> just, you know, and I can go back and forth. Is it God's will? Is it my will? God just does not call me to go on a dating site and bring some guy and some drama in my life. I just got rid of all of it. I don't want that. It does not call my name. I like celibacy. I have not had sex in 10 years, and I'm not ashamed to tell you. I like working with others. I like being a parent for my 25-year-old daughter. I like prime time. I like going to meetings. I like fellowshipping late at night. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. You know, and I don't want that, huh, can we work things out, you know, me and you talk to me. Do you have a little time at 5 this afternoon? There's something that bothers me. I don't want to live that anymore. I want to be free. I'm afraid of losing my sobriety. You know, I'm not afraid of losing it right now, today. I don't feel that feeling, but I understand it because my life is so valuable to me. Well, probably one of the scariest stories is the back injury story, and then the bike it in, and then off they go, and we see it over and over. It's really a frightening thing. So, you know what? I'm just scratching the surface. Like I said, I'm not an authority. This is my life. I'm letting you into my experience. I'm not perfect at this. I, I, I can't tell you that I had a perfect release from this. But, boy, I got to see my patterns and my frustration and my expectations and my lack of the ability to love other people and to allow them to be themselves and to express themselves in a healthy way. I bring in sick people, and things just get sicker and sicker. Anyway, I think that's it for right now. Thanks for letting me share. Do I, get a, do I get a question? question? Yes. Is this yours? No, Paul Doyle. No questions? Go for it. Catherine L. Paul. Hi, Catherine. Do you think that is why uh, it is suggested that if you're not in a relationship, to not get in one when you first approach recovery because of what you were just explaining? And it's not trying to run somebody's life, it's just that we're still coming. Yeah, you know, I, I don't like being the hall monitor or the AA police, and you're going to think this is a little bit crazy, but sometimes newcomers, they need to get in a relationship. I just think, go ahead, hit that shit, man. Take a left turn. Let's see a new bottom. Maybe you need that experience. Maybe you need to get in a relationship with a newcomer and light your hair on fire and blow your life up sober. You know, it's not something I recommend, but I don't try to put the brakes on because People are evolving, and if you're in a spiritual relationship with God, you're going to continue to look at self, and what you're even attracted to in early recovery is not at all what you're going to be attracted to or pulling in your life when you're years so sober. And I believe that our communication skills as alcoholics when we come in are very limited. You know, you want a piece of me? Well, then forget it. Then I hate you. Just erase my number. Okay, I'm, that's it. No more. That's it. That's it. You know, and there's no real problem-solving tools. There's no skills of communication. And so God makes that possible as we go on because we become better listeners and we start to back down and forgiveness rises up and compassion rises up. But in the beginning, walking in here, usually those higher emotions and higher states of consciousness aren't even available yet. They're somewhere buried beneath the untreated alcoholism. When I look up in the sky and I see Harry Tebow, what does this mean? Who is this? Okay. 
when I look up in the sky and I see Harry Tebow, what does this mean? It means you're still thinking about the ego, and I hope you get to see God next time you look up in the sky. <laughs> Is the four-step inventory something you practice on a daily basis? You know, the spiritual principles in the, in the 12 steps are something we, we practice on a daily basis. So I could, I could uh, you know look at somebody that that I have a resentment towards or I could continue to take personal inventory and when I'm wrong promptly admit it or I could look for my untreated alcoholism it, it, it's it, it's the tool of self reflection is what we're going for here is that I want to see how I'm meeting the world I want to see what I'm bringing to the table what kind of eyes am I using so no, I don't sit and do a four-step inventory homework assignment, but the application of looking at self continuously with my heart mind, not my head mind, and feeling my way into it and feeling a disturbance like, mm, that didn't go over well or that wasn't really so cool. Or maybe not beating myself up. Sometimes the ego will come in and go, God, why did you say that? Or why did you do that? Shouldn't I? You know, that could be the other side of it. And I'm thinking I need to clean something up and do some damage control for Valdez oil spill well really one more time the ego is masking itself as a god consciousness but you know the whole thing's infinite it, who knows each person has an individual relationship with the creative intelligence and hopefully god speaks through you and eventually you can hear the voice of god and you don't continue to call a sponsor every five minutes and take direction from a human being i think that there's overkill on that sometimes and i think that there are even sponsors that are very invested in my girls my guys my babies and, you know, there's really one ultimate authority, and it is a loving God as he expresses himself. And, yes, I have mistaken the voice of God, and it was the voice of self. Of course I have. Who hasn't? We all have. You know, but I, 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 pr I practice, you know, it's progress, not perfection, and I continue to, to move on in this, in this way, and I hopefully don't make more harms where I have to make a new list, a new grudge list, and I, and I live in... 10, 11, and 12, where I let go absolutely, and I seek through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact, and I carry a message to the best of my ability. When it comes to resentments towards my parents or adults who abused me as a child, do I have a part? Oh, God. Man, I am like such a... I'm a Ginzu knife master with this one. So, you see... Some people have been so injured by their parents, and Bill Wilson could never have seen the amount of toxicity and sodomy and violation and abuse and neglect and spanking and cigarette burning, and your parents tweaked and cracked and carpet crawling. And I mean, it's so unbelievable what I'm seeing today. The children that are coming in that grew up with meth parents Oh, my God, there's no way I could ever tell a child, well, you got a part in it. <clears throat> now, what we want to do is, for me personally as a sponsor, I like going all the way back into the pathology and figuring out when the child shut down and when they stopped using their heart and they stopped, started using their head because they didn't feel safe anymore. Because that's what I want to stir and wake up again. Because the heart mind is where the real intelligence is. So I like fishing around in there. And so one of my favorite things to do is, can you remember when you still loved your mom and dad? Can you remember when you believed that they were God? Can you remember when you started hating them? Can you remember when you stopped crying? Can you remember when you made a decision never to go to their birthday or even say I'm sorry or anything anymore? And we go into those places and usually that brings up a lot of emotion and no this isn't in the big book and if somebody like wants to do a thumper thing where's that in the literature it's not in the literature it's in me but I think that it's really important because I do feel that untreated alcoholism at least three quarters of it comes from the childhood pathology so when it comes to time to uh, making amends there'll be amends to make to clean things up and maybe a blanketed statement but it's really difficult when the parent has done 90% of the primary damage and there's this little 10% thing with the child. So I do, um, 
I hope you don't mind that I'm going to break John's anonymity, too. John and I took these amazing classes on pathology, and we learned so, so, so much. And we both came to the same conclusion. And this, John's been in it even longer than I have, and it's, like, mind-boggling. This therapist is unbelievable. And there was one thing that this woman did, did not like over and over in Alcoholics Anonymous. She did not like that the wounded had to stuff the wound in the basement and never confront the perpetrator and go and say they're sorry. And what this woman did was she studied a tremendous amount of uh, neuroscience and of emotional states and the retardation and the suppression of the child being able to grow into an adult. And until she believed, until you go back into your original wound and your original story and really excavate and pull it up, you're probably going to be stuck with a bunch of shit down in the basement. And I'm not saying that Bill and Bob are wrong. They did the very best they could, but we know more today. So I like going all the way down in there, and especially if the child hasn't overcome their demons and there's so much hurt, and they're like, I can't go to my dad. Do you know what he did to me? It's like, you're not going to your dad. Not like that, honey. The heart has to be so open and full of expression that it's like, I'm so done with my story. I'm so done with my demons. I really want to go give my psycho dad a big hug and tell him what my part in it is. So this is a process. It's not a race. And no offense to anybody else that's hardcore step people. Well, you didn't finish your amends. You're going to drink. That is the most uncool statement I feel that you could ever tell an alcoholic. It's not okay. For me to ever use that as some kind of leverage to force you into something, you don't do this. You're not going to get this. It doesn't go that way. God is infinite. The, 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 the amends process is infinite. My healing is infinite. It goes on forever. There's not just this finishing line by July. It better be done by July. Oh, that's, oh no. You're not in 11. Oh, what about that one thing? It's, it's not fair. For me personally, it's not fair. It's a lifelong journey. Um, anyway, is that it? One more. She's, she's right. Okay. Keep right. Or Bob. Sorry. Okay. Um, doesn't doesn't it get covered? I'm I'm a little bothered by the, the therapist. Um, <laughs> it gets covered. It, doesn't it get covered? I'll try to put this in a question for you. Doesn't it get covered in the big part where it says to ransack our past when we're doing the inventory? And it says, this is only a beginning. And I was taught to go back to the beginning of, of the parade. When did it start? Where did it start? Just like you. Yeah, yeah. And so Alcoholics Anonymous has never presented anything else to me but that. Okay, and that's a really good point because I've had both sides of sponsorship. I've had sponsors say things like, well, you have to take responsibility for your own life, and when did you start drinking, or when did you start cheating and lying, and every, everything above then is what we're going to inventory. Your childhood, we don't want to look at it, we don't want to see you when, when you were a baby, that has nothing to do with your drinking. Your parents never pinned you down to a chair and poured liquor down your throat. But now we know that we were in so much pain, we were going to relief, we were going to seek pain relief. So we were going to cut or burn or masturbate or shop or drink or eat or snort or smoke or whatever, pick your poison. So... I've seen sponsorship do both ways, and I don't really have a, for, for me, I never had a sponsor take me deep into my childhood. Yeah, and that's also, uh, uh, I don't want to overemphasize, like, oh, let's wallow around in your freaking childhood. For It's not that either. I would hope that the new character was built enough in the first three steps that the, the God mind is this big and the self mind is this big so we can go in and stay awake without choking to death on our emotions. Oh, God, it's just so much. I can't even get out of bed. That thing we talked about yesterday, I'm fucking suffering. It's not time to go in there yet if we're doing that. <laughs> right. We need a bigger foundation with step two and step three. But I'm not an expert. I don't know. You know, I mean, this is all experiential. For, I really, people have had magical white light things where things were just lifted. I mean, I know a guy whose dad beat him severely for years and years and years. And his dad was a police officer. And he went and he promises me when he went and flew all the way to Massachusetts and did his amends, he never talked to his dad about beating all all the kids. The daughter, she stayed out one night, lost her virginity, and she had hair down to here, and the dad pulled all the hair and just chopped it all off and threw it in the snow. Like, this was a brutal dad. And my friend swears all his resentments are gone, and I can see it in his eyes. They're gone. 
I see it and I hear it. It's so weird. It's I don't know. I I don't know, man. I just had so much hatred in my heart. I'm so injured and so hurt. It was so hard to scrub the stains off of my soul. I needed a lot of help, and I still need. I need a lot of help. But thanks for the question, John. <laughs> but do you agree that she, what she was asking, that it is the big book? Sure, it says everything. It says all. But yeah, but but. If you don't have a sponsor with a big, huge flashlight, you see, denial is there for a reason. The ego built this brick wall on that shit in the basement so that I don't feel pain anymore. How am I going to get into the heart? It usually takes another person. Self-reflection often isn't enough because it's like, oh, God, there's that feeling. I don't want to think it. I don't want to think it. I don't want to think it. And it's like, no, now today we're really going to think it. Let's go in there. Yeah. But in the end, really, it's God. God's going to do it. You know, we can fish around like that all day and not get anywhere. Look at all the millions of dollars spent on therapy. And a lot of times I don't see these people growing. Go ahead. Uh, all right, too, because um, that question came up for me at a counseling job. It's not so much as an AA, although it does listen to you, but that in my own childhood, my part of my childhood to me was how I reacted to it later. Pathology and the defect that you yeah. grew, yeah. right? Yeah. I always get when oh, I have the part I'm responsible. Like, yeah. I'm responsible how I react. Right. I have to be a liar now because my mother says, yeah. "Did you do?" Uh oh, -uh, because I know I'm about to get hit. I gotta lie. Did you eat those cookies? And there's crumbs all over my face. Uh oh, -uh. oh, canary feathers everywhere. I have to lie. I have no choice. I'm about to get the shit knocked out of me. Yeah, that's really good. I like that. That's awesome. Thank you. Is there Shelly? Thanks. You did a great job, Shelly. I like the stuff you brought up. The the classes you went about the knowledge that was so cool. So. You have this part C, and they write the inventory, the four columns, right? But do you show them the exercise in the prayer? Perhaps the person that's been in these spiritually, like myself, I have to show the kind yeah, it's at the top of every single. Right, and the spirit of forgiveness comes, so you could see that person is sixty to write your column with. Right. Is that how you? It is, yeah. With the prayer at the top of each, each and every one of them. Yeah. Thanks, Shelley. Anybody else? We're all good. Right on. Thank you for the. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Tracy. I'm representing Northern California here. Party name rocks. Yeah. Step five. Admit it to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. I want to thank Astrid for taking me back through my childhood and my sex life. <laughs> so, uh, we'll start out by this first paragraph in the 12 and 12. All of AA's 12 steps ask us, to go to contrary to our natural desires. They all deflate our egos. When it comes to ego deflation, few steps are harder to take than five, but scarcely any step is more necessary to long-term sobriety and peace of mind than this one. It's a big paragraph for me. And, um, what are we likely to receive from step five? For one thing, we shall get rid of the terrible sense of isolation we've always had. Almost without exception, alcoholics are tortured by loneliness, even before our drinking got bad and people cut, began to cut us off. Nearly all of us suffered the feeling that we didn't quite belong. So that pretty much sums it up on step five, how I felt. Um, you know, I really love the primetime message because, uh, especially when I hear you guys all share and everything, um, uh, I feel okay because... Um, I suffer from, from uh, terminal uniqueness. You know, at least I think that. And that's my problem. Uh, uh, I believe what I think at times. So uh, what Astrid was talking about with step four is, um, it was interesting when I uh, did my fir first four step around with my first sponsor, um, I didn't want to take a look at myself. I was scared to see what I would find. 
So my sponsor finally did set a date, get it done by this date, and I finally sat down and started writing it out and uh, started seeing a pattern. And the problem with doing, for me, the problem doing step four is I kept looking ahead and seeing step five. I was terrified of sharing uh, sharing myself with someone else. And it paralyzed me. Fear sometimes paralyzes me. And, and I realize that lack of faith is, you know, that's what it is for me at times. So um, finally, I, I got the got it all done. And me and my sponsor, there was a, an AA Founders Day celebration in San Francisco. And I'll never forget this day. We There was a barbecue. And uh, after the barbecue, we went and sat on this uh, park bench in Stern Grove. And um, we we're going to read it out. And um, I sit down on the bench with my sponsor, and he crosses his arms. And this is like he's right here. And he says, nudge me if I fall asleep. <laughs> I was so appalled. <laughs> but I started reading it out, and, and I didn't get too far in it, and I just started see, feeling this, like, wow, that I had a huge part in a lot of things. And... Um, I said, do I have to finish? And he says, yeah, just finish reading it. You know, for me, things did change. You know, I started this awakening. So um, he was a gay sponsor. So the next sponsor that I got, I wanted to go through the steps with a straight sponsor. Because of this terminal uniqueness, I think I'm different. And I think that sets me aside. Uh, being gay sets me aside from uh, my fellows. And it really doesn't. I learned, I moved down to the peninsula in, in uh, Burlingame and... Um, I remember moving down there. Uh, I had three years of sobriety and, and um, was afraid to talk about being gay. And I have a lot of internalized homophobia. I had a lot of internalized homophobia. And I remember talking about it and uh, looking around the room, looking. Who's reacting? Who's reacting? Nobody was. It was me. I'm the only one that's reacting to it. You know. And, and what I realized is this is a incredible men's meeting down there that I go to. Um, this is that's a, such a non-issue in here. You know, being gay is such a non-issue in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's about um, overcoming the disease of alcoholism. So, anyways, um, one of the funny things that I didn't realize, and I'll share one of my um, items on my first fourth step, was um, I met up with somebody uh, late at night in the kind of Tenderloin Union Square area of uh, San Francisco. And I didn't bother to look at the parking meter. And this was late at night, so parking meters usually start at 9 o'clock. So I go out to just before 9 o'clock to leave, and I have a ticket. And I looked at the meter, and it's 7 o'clock. So, I, of course, I'm going to be upset. I go home, and then, um, of course, I didn't open my mail. I'm suffering from the disease really seriously. I never opened my mail. I never answered my phone. And all of a sudden, this warning ticket comes that I need to pay this uh, warning reminder comes for this ticket. And... And I forget about it again, and the next time I, I realize I have to pay this ticket, I go online and it's a day late, so the fine is doubled. So I finally pay it. And I'm so in the disease of alcoholism, I'm going to get back at these people. <laughs> so I, I get a bunch of tubes of um, super glue, and I go out in front of my building and squeeze all the parking meters full of uh, super glue. <laughs> these, how dare these bastards do this to me? I couldn't see my part in that. It was my fault. I didn't check the meter. I didn't pay the ticket on time. But that's how, that's a summary of how I thought. They did it to me. You know, I started seeing this stuff. Oh, I've got a part in this. You know, so going through the steps again was very, uh, that time was kind of all the stuff that was on top, the stuff that was blocking me. The next time I went through with a straight sponsor, um, it was it was very deep, very thorough. And I, um, I revealed a lot of things to him. And he revealed a lot of things to me. He actually did it first before I did. And, you know, there's a lot of things that I did to support myself during the 80s and 90s, you know, when I, that I was ashamed of, you know, and that, that's not how I was raised. But it's the things that I did. And we talked about this stuff, and he told me things he did. And I realized, you know, um, I'll never forget sitting at this grub steak on Pine Street in San Francisco one time with a friend of mine who's just passed. And uh, bless his heart, this man taught me so much. And, and I was telling him a lot of things about me, and he just gets right in my face, and he says, Tracy, you know what? You're nothing but a, a garden variety alcoholic. Really? Not me. You don't know me that well, but it is the truth, you know. I suffer from the bondage of self, and a lot of times it's a reverse ego, and that's what keeps coming up in um, my steps. I'm doing a, a fourth step now through the BBA, 
And uh, the boy, does that stuff dig deep. And this is what I am is with some outside help and with my sponsor and with another friend in, in a prime time meeting, um, digging deep to this childhood stuff because I came from a really dysfunctional family and I'm very damaged from my childhood. And I'm not blaming it on that, but it's digging through this stuff and it's bringing this stuff to the surface to get rid of it, to see light. You know, for so many years I drank and used drugs to stuff this stuff because I didn't like who I was. You know, I wouldn't even let you get to know me because you'd hate me as much as I hated myself. That's how I went through life, but I didn't even know it, though. It was um, really amazing, the delusion that I have. And alcohol did for me what I couldn't do for myself for many, many years. You know, I could be whoever you wanted me to be. I could be who I wanted to be. I could just delusion. So the, the thing is, with doing fourth and fifth steps and sharing this with another human being is I get to see, to uncover and see who my true self is. And not be ashamed. Letting go of shame. If you grew up in an alcoholic household, the shame that we carry around. You know, standing up here with this, that first paragraph and everything and talking about this, this is not what I was raised to do. I was not raised to stand up here and talk to you guys honestly. Or talk to you guys, period. You know, we didn't air our dirty laundry. You never told anybody anything. You know, there's one time uh, when I was 16 years old in a blackout, I was arrested for vandalism in the neighborhood, and um, I was terrified of my mom. And this just came up just recently, and I, I had to go to my mom and tell her this. And I remember sitting on the steps telling her, and I was terrified of telling her this. And her response was, how dare you do this to me? <laughs> go, oh, that's what I was afraid of, you know. And little did I know, I took on those same traits. A lot of that stuff I carried with me into adulthood, I still carry with me. And this fourth step now is uncovering this stuff. And I've been writing out four steps, and a lot of them are very similar. I'm triggered by certain people. They trigger something in me. It's amazing how dominated by people I am. I give my power away, or I give power away to these people. And uncovering this and seeing how much power I give to these people. You know, there's that line in there that people really dominated us. They had the power to kill us. This is the stuff I used to drink over. So, and, and all of a sudden, here I am, digging all this stuff up, but I have a higher power. I have a God of my understanding in my life who wants me to be happy, joyous, and free. And bringing this stuff to, to the sunlight of the Spirit and just letting it go and uncovering it. And um, a, a little bit about um, the fourth step with my mom is um, I did make amends to my mom because I didn't talk to her for 23 years. And that was my part. And I, and I remember sitting in, in her sunroom one, one day when I finally went there, and it took a couple years for me to actually uh, stop and see her. Uh, sitting in there, and the first thing out of my mouth was, you know I'm gay, right? She said, I've known that. You know, there's one down. The second one is, um, <laughs> one fear down. The second one was, um, I'm sober and Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm here to make amends. And I told her, I said, you know, I just didn't think you loved me as a child. And then she started crying. And then something really happened inside me, this sense of awareness. And I, I learned this uh, saying recently is that hurt people hurt people. You know, and, um, you know, I don't want to use this as a cop-out, but it, it, it is. It, she did the best she could with, you know, what she had. She came from a crazy household as well, and she did the best she could. And, you know, letting that stuff go. And then I was able to be there for my mom when she passed away of cancer. I was the only child to show up out of three of us because the rest of them have cancer. And I sat there with my mother for a week and watched her die of cancer. And I was able to help write the obituary and, uh, you know, the um, planner service and everything like that, all the way down to the pink coffin that she wanted. And I was able to carry that coffin out to the car and say goodbye to my mom. This is the woman I didn't think loved me. And I was able to let this stuff go. And I went to the Solano Club in Oneida where I grew up, and um, these people carried me through this stuff. It's about sharing my inner self what I'm going through, not being ashamed of this, just um, putting myself out there. It's funny because when I, want, when I get up here to talk, my hands start sweating, I get nervous, i got to go to the bathroom, and because this goes against, this breaks the loyalty of my childhood, standing up here being honest. It, sure, it so does. But you know what the benefits from um, sharing with myself, my God, and another person are incredible. The rewards that we get from working the program of Alcoholics Anonymous are incredible. And I've really gotten this change through the message of prime time. You know, um, we only have one meeting up there, and it's really a shame because I just went to this meeting Thursday, and this guy, all he talked about was him. 
had nothing to do with recovery and everything. And I finally just walked down the hallway and played a video game because I just I I so so tired of sitting there listening to what it was like, what it was like, what it was like, not what we were like, but what it was like, you know. And um, then about a, a, a tiny fragment of um, what I'm like now. And but you know, I go to that Saturday night meeting and, and we hear the message from you guys. We listen to CDs from you guys, and we it's. Um, really changed my life incredibly and I, I'm not ashamed of myself anymore and I'm learning to love myself because you guys have loved me and, and it's really amazing um, I, I, I did one of the my worksheets with um, somebody from primetime that you guys know John and um, he read some of this to me and the similarities that we all suffer from um, I don't know what it does to me it just opens up my heart because there's for so many years of um, the crazy relationships, the self-abuse, the um, destructive life, you know, I was diagnosed with HIV back in 89, and I remember the, my doctor telling me that I had six months to live, and I, and, um, I said, oh, good. You know, that was my attitude, you know. But here I am, how many years later? You know, it wasn't my path. But... Um, the years of self-destruction and just trying to ruin myself and sharing that with another person and seeing that I'm not unique in that. You know, I suffer from the disease of alcoholism, the bondage of self, and learning on a daily basis in the day that I'm in, you know, I take some time in the morning to um, make a conscious contact with God because when I wake up, it's on. The mind is going before I am. And, you know, as the years go by and I get more and more in contact with a higher power, it gets quieter. Do I still create chaos in my life? Yes. Do I try to blame it on other people? Yes. But, you know, it's that we claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. I'll end on this just recently. Um, this is what happens. I managed this building on uh, Burlingame, and um, I had to do some repair work in these people's house. And it was, um, Before I went up there, I got myself into such a tizzy. Because I know they did this stuff intentionally. Just, you know, I take things so personally. I work myself up into such a tizzy. And I walk up there and these people were nice as pie to me. And I walk out of there like, this is what I do to myself. You know, I'm the primary cause of the chaos in my life. It has nothing to do with anybody else now. I accept that responsibility. You know, and it's in the day I am. Today I'll have a wonderful day today. And tomorrow it's rinse and repeat. And I get to do it all over again. So um, I'm really grateful to be here, and uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Did that sponsor fall asleep? Yeah. My sponsor fall asleep? No, he didn't. <laughs> Can you talk about what you did or didn't do for the 24 hours after you finished reading your sponsor? Oh, that's a good part. But I, I believe that's step six. But um, I did go home and uh, open up the book and look at the previous steps. And, and um, uh, look through my past to see if there were there was anything that I omitted. You know, oh, that's the part. Yeah, see, this is what I like about the questions is because it reminds me of things I forgot about. There is the part about you're only as sick as your secrets. You know, uh, am I really, am I, is there anything that I'm holding on to that I will not share? And that is very important. Um, there was something, and, and I did talk to my sponsor about it, because I, you know, um, some behaviors and everything. But I did go home and look at my part and, um, and spend an hour meditating you know, to um, review my past and see if there's anything on there. That's, for me, this is why I think it's important to keep continuing going through the steps because more is always being revealed. I, this is actually, I've been through the steps another time, but I didn't write out the four steps, so now I'm doing it now. And I, I get to uncover more and more stuff about myself. There's a line that I, in one of the prayers that I use, is that um, I pray to become the person that God created me to be, the true me. You know, there's there's truth I have truth, my truth, that I was born with down deep underneath a lot of garbage, a lot of years of wreckage and destruction and everything. And every time I go through these steps and, and write them out, 
and, and discuss them with another person, I get to share this stuff. And, and I am relieved of it. You know, some of the things are continue to be there. But I realize, you know, I, I think for me, the, uh, the part about Alcoholics Anonymous that I love the most is it's a program of awareness. I'm learning to, you know, to become aware of um, my triggers. You know, and I do surrender them up. So I'm going to creep right back in there because I'm human. You know, so um, I don't know if I addressed the question properly. Why is the admission of our wrongs to another human being so critical to recovery? And is their response important or therapeutic? Good question. Uh, I was actually, I was reading this book, uh, The Art of Confession, and even the 12 and 12 touches on it, and it, it talks about how long it's, uh, confession has been around for centuries. Uh, religions have done it, and um, even therapists and psychiatrists and all that. You know, it is very important to me be honest with another person because it, the 12 and 12 talks about how delusional I can be with myself if I don't talk to another person. You know, there's that funny line that I like to use is, uh, left to my own devices, I can dig myself into a ditch and bury myself in there. But when I talk to another person, I see clarity. I get clarity. And, and it is a very important because it makes me feel a part of. You know, it breaks that isolation that I suffered from for so many years. You know, there's... um a guy up in um, San Mateo, where I live, and um, he met with a guy who 12-stepped him, and it's part of this, and he asked him what his definition of an alcoholic was, and I know we got the one from Ted, which I love, and this one is very similar, and, and he told him it was um, a man in conflict with himself, his God, and the world around him, and I realized that I create that conflict, I create that, I overreact to misperceptions, so when I talk to another person, it's very important to get their uh, clarity on it as well. So, how do you start your day to stay in the moment and remember you are? I, I can't read the rest. Maybe untreated alcoholism. Yeah, you are living with untreated alcoholism, and to be honest and forthright in starting your day. Okay. How do you start? How do I start my day? Um, I can go through the whole scenario, actually. It's a, kind of a ritual that I do every morning. Um, I wake up, of course, and I say, good morning, God. And um, then I go and put the, the kettle on, make coffee. I go outside and bring the newspapers in, and I make a cup of coffee, and I sit down, and I do a lot of prayers. Um, then I do a couple of readings. I read um, just for today and uh, the daily reflections, and I read around the year with Emmett Fox, which really helps me incredibly, the spiritual side of this. And then I journal. I actually write uh, things that are going on, the gifts of my life, or um, uh, things that I've discovered you know, through the prayer and through the readings, and uh, that's my quiet time with God is the journaling, because I really connect with God when I write. When I put the pen to paper, I I, I really get a connection with my God. And um, how do I uh, treat the, uh, during the day if I'm an untreated alcoholism? I call somebody, you know, or I go talk to somebody, and um, I get out of my head by talking to another human being. It's what step uh, five is all about. Um, even the person doesn't even have to be an Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, um, it's just me not being by myself. Yeah. So. Did I experience the fifth step promises? Hmm. Um. You know, the first time I did, uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, sitting in Stern Grove, it was foggy because it's close to the ocean in San Francisco. And when I was done with that, it was clear. 
<laughs> and it was for me as well. Not only the sky, but all of a sudden I did have a realization. I felt the power of sharing with another person, you know, my true self, and being able to let go of this stuff. So um, I did experience the promise of um, a spiritual experience. So I'm not sure that's all the, what the promises are. I don't exactly remember what they all are. Oh, forgiveness. Jeez, how could I forget forgiveness? Yeah. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, one of um, the prayers that I've been praying lately, and this is with the help of uh, outside help, that I'm really, 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 really learning about myself is um, to admit that I'm powerless over my impatience with myself. I didn't realize how impatient I am with myself. I am the, the judge, the jury, the critic, the cynic, everything with myself. And um, so I got to admit my powerless over my impatience with myself. And I pray for the willingness to become patient with myself. And it's learning. That's the forgiveness. Learning to let that stuff go and just forgive myself. You know, it was, um, I'm not blaming anybody, but I know where a lot of this stuff comes from. And it comes from trying to be perfect my whole life. Struggling to be perfect because if I was, could be perfect at home, I wouldn't get beaten. You know, um, so, and that carries through life. You know, it's, it's amazing because, I didn't realize how, how many years I walked around with this facade, that everything's just fine on the outside, but you never knew. And I learned that very early in the house because I was the man. I took care of everything. I painted the house. I did the lawn. I planted the flowers, trying to make our house look like um, everybody else is in the neighborhood. Meanwhile, it was chaotic inside, and I carried that with me. And it was that refusal to ask for help. Um, yeah. So there's the forgiveness. A lot of this forgiveness is, had to be myself. But it says forgiveness of others as well. Yeah. That came making amends. Step five. Yeah. The forgiveness, I, I had to do the forgiveness with me, and then I could carry it on when I started doing my amends. And that's when I, when I, when I approached my mom. The, the, the amends really came. The forgiveness came for me, <laughs> you know, as being able to talk to my mom about all this stuff. Oh, there's one more. Snuck in. Can you do a fifth step with a priest, and why or why not is this a good idea? Oh, I, I noticed um, in the Mind Power Disease, uh, somebody asked Bob Anderson this question, and um, he said, "Sure, you can, but it's more advisable to do it with an alcoholic, somebody who really, really understands the disease of alcoholism." That, that would be my opinion as well. Um, but the church that I go to, the priest actually happens, or the pastor actually happens to be an AA, so it would work for me. <laughs> so if you know they're a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, I know there's quite a few that are, sure, I don't see a problem with it. But I, I, from my own opinion, I think it would be best to go to somebody that, that um, is familiar with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. So, is that it? Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.